Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. So I just wanted to thank Helen for chairing this session and to uh, Mary Claire for inviting me to contribute to this seminar series. I'm very, very much looking forward to hearing the rest of the papers uh, in this term series, including I'm delighted to see another paper on early modern female adolescence uh, about apprentice girls in November by Laura Gowring. So the focus of this uh, paper is the diary of Betty Fothergill, which recalls the life of a 17 year old Quaker girl living in 18th century London, preparing for marriage. As Mary Wisner Hanks states, um, marriage was the clearest mark of social adulthood for both men and women in this period, with Sarah Mendelssohn and Patricia Crawford describing how marriage represented a break from the dependence of childhood and the semi dependence of adolescence and service. This paper examines how Betty anticipated this shift from adolescence to our adulthood through marriage, how her perspective and experiences as a Quaker influenced her perception of a changing gendered identity, and what this tells us about the spectrum of beliefs surrounding the rights and roles of young Quaker women in this period. So at its core, this paper considers how Betty interpreted social and religious conventions surrounding marriage in her time period, and what her writing conveys about Quaker women's changing position in public, private and social spheres over the course of the early life cycle in particular. So I just want to add a brief comment here on the use of the term adolescence in this paper. Um, I know the use of the term has been somewhat contentious in view of Stanley Hall's work, but as many early modernists now concur, there was a comparable life stage of adolescence or youth in a pre-1800 era. As Elizabeth S. Cohen and Margaret Reeves comment in their edited collection on the youth of early modern women, which is a fabulous book uh, for anyone interested on the sub of subject. Did early modern women have a youth? Yes. Although scholarship has ignored, but also in some contexts rejected a category for female youth. European women, in fact, underwent a distinctive shaping time between childhood and full adult status. My decision to focus uh, in this paper and in my research on female adolescence in the early modern period is in part a response to continued obscurity of girls and adolescents in the period of 1660 to 1785 in England. But first, a little bit of background to my research and how uh, Betty fits within it. So as Helen mentioned, I work on identifying and cataloguing female adolescent writings. Um, so this is just a sample uh, on, on the screen of a couple of uh, diaries from this period. You can see Betty Fothergill's to the far right. Um, I believe this is Catherine Tarleston's the next one over, um, as well as Anne Molyneux and pocketbooks from Francis Sneed and I believe Elizabeth Watkins. So one of the most common questions I'm asked when talking about my research is whether there were any extent uh, examples of adolescent writers during this period uh, and do they exist in large enough numbers to analyse as a source corpus. So my research has shown that there are significant numbers of extant ex examples of uh, girls writing in this period from diaries to love letters, family comments to pocketbooks. However, an awareness of this source corpus has often been unwittingly obscured by scholarly archival and digitisation processes. This is just now beginning to be unpacked with an increasing number of texts on girlhood and adolescence appearing in recent years and highlighting adolescent writing. More work though needs to be done in this area, especially with making the extent and range of this source material more visible. So one of the main reasons behind the continued invisibility of female adolescent accounts is a lack of extensive biographical data. Many articles of adolescent writing are standalone pieces. So they're a series of diaries covering maybe a year, maybe two, where there's his, a silence in the historical record after. And that's the case with uh, Betty Fothergill's diary. It, it covers a series of months, but after that, we have very little detail about her life. So in many cases, young female writers like Betty did not go on to be prolific writers during adulthood. Consequently, it's been easier for scholars to pass over shorter, less lengthy pieces of adolescent writing in favour of considering the work of female writers with longer writing careers that continue into adulthood. As Leonie Hannon writes in her study, Women of Letters, Gender, Writing and the Life of the Mind, this reliance on a discrete canon of female creative talent tends to un underline the broader presumption that very few women wrote anything of interest at this time. 
and that this need for the individual to have created systemically over their lifetime disenfranchises many female participates, participants from intellectual history altogether. And this is particularly the case with um, female adolescents. Now, part of the reason I bring this up now is that many of us are faced uh, with the issues of um, digitization or the issues that are compounded through digitization in regards to the invisibility of, of girls and women uh, in online databases. Um, firstly, we know that women are often underrepresented um, in physical archives and that this can be magnified through digitization. And while search engines um, and online databases databases have now been created that address this absent and list numerous female writers from the early modern period through to the 18th century. We know these lists are not comprehensive and they can miss out on less well-documented writers, which as we know, adolescent writers tend to be. So consequently, the scholar looking to account for the female adolescent girl's experience and perspective is often faced with a considerable amount of work to isolate examples of early female writing. For those not aware of the gap in this digital um, source database then, they would likely assume that the material simply does not exist. These are just some of the issues that my research and my online repository um, aims to combat in the hope that we might begin to redress this historic underrepresentation of female adolescents and female adolescent writers in England in this period. At its core, my research in this paper asks how the addition of young women's writings might allow us to expand and reimagine aspects of the gender bodily experience, maturation and the role of girls within society. Girls' increased exposure to social ideals and expectations make them fascinating arbiters of contemporary movements and social changes in England between 1660 and 1785. They participate in society in ways that can privately and publicly challenge, question or champion prevailing norms as individuals make observations about the world they're learning to inhabit. So over the course of this paper then I would ask you to consider what we might be missing or omitting uh, by leaving these sources out of history uh, and part of this period of English history. How might the addition of adolescent writings alter our outlook on intellectual, religious, social and women's histories in the period after the restoration? It is an attempt to answer this question that I want to bring one, one example of an adolescent diarist to your attention. And this is how we come to the focus of this paper, Betty Fothergill. So the diaries of Betty Fothergill, um, which run from October 1769 to May 1770, offer one of the most extensive discussions of the psychological and emotional journey towards marriage and adulthood in late adolescence uh, during the 18th century. Consisting of three volumes held in the Society of Friends Library in London, these diaries cover the period immediate prior of the uh, before her marriage um, to Alexander Chorley on the 18th of October, 1770. Betty's diary maps her mental and emotional preparations uh, in anticipation of this change during the late stages of her adolescence. Her reflections on marriage help illuminate the impact of Quakerism on a girl's development, particularly in developing a sense of her inner intellectual world and her sense of selfhood and gender in adolescence. It is a rich source for showing the spectrum of beliefs about the rights and roles of women in Quaker communities in the, in the 18th century and how this might change in the transition from adolescent to adult. So we know only the bare bones of Betty's life prior to the onset of her diary. She was born in Warrington, Lancashire on the 3rd of October 1752 and was the youngest surviving child of Joseph Fothergill and Hannah Fothergill Nee Kelsall. It appears that a significant extent of Betty's childhood was marked by death. Betty lost her mother by age six, her infant brother Joseph and her younger brother, sister Catherine by age seven and her father by age nine. Writing in her diary on the topic of childhood, she commented that it is certainly a mistaken opinion that children are exempt from sorrow and recalls in memorandum how I never so sensibly know the loss of a mother as when she sees her friends with theirs. As a broader family though, the Fothergills were well regarded and reasonably affluent. They held a prominent standing within the Quaker communities of London, Lancashire and Liverpool. Betty's paternal uncle, uh, Samuel Fothergill, who uh, we have a picture or a silhouette of to the right hand side here, was a well-known minister 
doctor who travelled the colonies to preach before settling back in London, whilst her other paternal uncle, Dr John Fothergill, was a renowned physician, botanist and fellow of the Royal Society with a well-established medical practice in London. So despite the loss of her parents, it appears that Betty remained uh, in Warrington, most likely under the care of her eldest brother for much of her early life, who also had had a house in the area. It is his death a year before the onset of her diary that Betty claims leads to, quote, a total revolution in my situation, my unexpected engagement with AC or Alexander Chorley, leaving my native habitation and coming to London. Her guardianship appears to be temporarily transferred to her uncle Samuel after the engagement to Alexander and the death of her brother. This helps explain her move to the London residence as a means of protecting her reputation from uh, threat and scandal, uh, potentially during that precarious period of a girl's life between engagement and marriage. Um, so it is to her Uncle Samuel's residence in London that she and her older sister Mary or Molly are travelling when her diary opens, and this is the opening uh, account uh, of uh, Betty's diary. So on the fifth day of the 19th of October 1769, at six o'clock in the morning, with unspeakable regret, I bid adieu to my dear friends at Warrington and began my journey to London. How many sighs did the painful separation separation from my native abode and from that person who is dearest to me and in whom all my earthly happiness is centred. The lively and keen sorrow his heart experienced greatly added to mine, which not even the probability of our meeting again in a few months and being united by the most indisposable tie could alleviate. How apt is the mind to sink under present evil and forget future prospects of happiness. So this passage reveals the first hint that Betty Fothergill has entered into an engagement prior to her leaving for the capital. Betty writes of a painful separation from a person she considers central to her earthly happiness, who she will later be tied in a most indisposable tie, or as we can read into this marriage. So this person, later referenced as AC, is one Alexandra Chorley, the third son of Lancashire gentleman Alexander Chorley, who was an ironmonger and who would be her future husband. So at least initially, Betty writes she is distressed at being separated from Alexander. Indeed, she spends the first few weeks at her new residence in London, grim faced, finding her surroundings in Harper Street near Red Lion Square disagreeable and gloomy. Um, I've produced a later print of Red Lion Square um, for you here. So um, just to give you a sense of where that would be today, it's near modern day uh, Bloomsbury. It's actually not far from um, where the um, Society of Friends has their archive um, today. So Betty soothes herself in these new surroundings um, that, quote, Providence wisely justly dispenses with good and evil, and that this separation she construed would be a test of their intellectual and spiritual um, connection and compatibility during their separation. At the earliest stages of her diary then, the prospect of a union with Alexander and herself and her impending transition into adulthood is a source of joy. It is an event which Betty eagerly awaits as both families negotiate the formal logistics of a match and she experiences her last months of adolescence in London. So during Alexander's absence, letters act as a material conduit for his physical presence and affection. Betty writes that Alexander's tenderness and his quote, compliments afford her a secret satisfaction as they show she was tenderly beloved and still reigned mistress in a heart whose constant attachment is so necessary for my happiness. 18th century young women expected a certain level of attentiveness from their prospective husbands in the period of courtship um, prior to marriage to be maintained in part through letters. In this negotiation, women often expected a level of power and authority over their suitors, uh, to often to be enacted through the strategic denial or acceptance of romantic overtures. Mary Wollstonecraft would later refer to this power dynamic within courtship as the short-lived tyranny of women over men in the human life cycle. The courtship between Betty and Alexander, though, was significantly um, disrupted when Alexander responds in an ill manner following an incident where Betty tries to offer advice on his conduct. Whilst the letter in the end was possibly not the most potent weapon in the artillery of the male suitor, if misused, it held the potential to significantly disrupt an otherwise, otherwise smooth transition from adolescence into to, uh, marriage, at least in the earliest stages. So 
Despite Betty offering suggestions, quote, in the manner my real regard suggested and not with the acrimony of a severe critic, Alexander responded with a cool thanks and several accusations of want of affection and in short, an air of cold mistaken pride. Whilst it was not in common for the established discourse within the established discourse of love letters for male suitors to protest coolness from their female counterparts, it seems that Betty does not respond well to this affront from um, Alexander, writing bitterly in her diary, how ungrateful is man? I imagined I had got myself a phoenix that would always love me, always be grateful, always be compliant, and in short be everything, but his letters convince me he is like the rest. In my last letter, I ventured to give him some advice on a few things. They were errors which I knew he could easily correct. But it seems that none of these lords of creation will bear remonstrations from the lips of poor, contemptible women. As Sally Holloway writes in The Game of Love in George in England, Quaker writers often characterise marriage as a union of minds and spirits. And during courtship, it was especially important to establish and maintain an intellectual collection geared towards mutual respect and religious improvement. In this dynamic of Quaker courtship then, it was increasingly common that women would summon men from excessive concerns about personal wealth to this idea of a pure spiritual life. So, in many ways, the Quaker faith has been uh, regarded as affording um, a greater spiritual and intellectual recognition to women in this period. Um, with women like Betty's own aunt, Susanna Crowdson, acting as Quaker ministers in their own right. However, these expressions of uh, religious agency could lead to tensions between uh, men and women, as we can see in this exchange. And, and this is something that we see time and time again in correspondence um, in the 18th century. So at this point in the 18th century, there was some uncertainty about the role of women as authority members within the Quakers, with concerns arising about female ambition exposing Quakers to ridicule. So Betty's own uncle, Samuel Fothergill, wrote to his protege, uh, Minister Catherine Payton, quote, bear thy testimony against haughtiness and luxury by a humble, watchful consult. Be not led by them out of the leadings of truth. I am sensible there is some danger in this regard. It appears that whilst many male Quakers were willing to accept women's guidance if it held from prophecy um, or the inner truth, which was commonly expressed in, in Quaker meetings, they were less willing to be berated if it was um, held to be advice based on um, observed leadings of truth. So through um, Betty's rejecting Betty's spiritual corrections then, Alexander draws into question whether he is a man capable of adequately respecting the spiritual guidance and observations of a woman destined to be his wife. Betty, who is clearly an intelligent, educated girl raised by her uh, uncle and aunt to express her thoughts to male company um, and for that to be respected and heard, as we shall explore later, remains unsettled by Alexander's remarks and concern that implies a lack of due uh, regard and consideration. Better later writes that Alexander's failure to overcome personal pride calls into question his religious character. After all, Quakerism asked of its followers self negation as well as self expression, to subdue at least some of one's own habits, desires, and impulses till they had learned to hone them and narrow them towards the interests of God. That Alexander appears unable and unwilling to subdue his own pride and work towards self-negation, thus leads Betty to question his dedication to individual perfectibility and consequently their spiritual and intellectual compatibility. These fears are only exacerbated when Alexander attempts to engender an apology from Betty for wrongdoing. Betty does not apologise. Indeed, if anything, it solidifies her certainty of, quote, the rectitude of my own conduct and his consciousness of his own guilt. She writes her heart recoils at the thought of such a lover and how much more at the thought of an intimate connection. By this stage, though, it seems that the formal negotiation for marriage between the two families prevented a natural cessation to the courtship. To do so would possibly endanger her fragile reputation, leading to more harm than good. Consequently, it is from this point onwards that Betty begins to discuss in detail her concerns about the prospect of entering into a binding commitment of marriage. She questions what she is about to lose of her adolescent self in her transition to the state of wife. Now, 
anyone who is familiar with um, discussions of marriage in this period will know that that the prospect of marriage for women could excite a mixture of emotions within adolescent writers, ranging from aberration to abject fear, from excitement to resignation. So upon her cousin's marriage, Mary Ward, then aged 26, wrote of how no woman of understanding can marry without infinite apprehensions beforehand. For Betty, though, it seems that her concerns extend beyond apprehensions though to a raging internal debate about Alexander's religious devotion, his commitment to intellectual parity and the relative physical, emotional and spiritual demands of wives and husbands. Betty writes of being able um, to reflect on notions of religious and personal agency for women as she makes comparisons between the experiences of adolescents um, up until this point and her observations of what wifehood looks like in her social circle. So there is one key passage that I would like to bring to your attention in this regard. Um, it is quite lengthy, but I've decided to reproduce it and read it in full, partly because it appears as a pivotal moment in Betty's account, um, although I have highlighted sections um, of particular interest. So having been separated by 200 miles for nearly two months on the 21st of December, uh, 1769, Father Gill pauses her daily com uh, commentary of memorandums, religious observances and social engagements to record an important development. This day I shall remember from taking the first solemn step towards matrimony preparation. I may well sigh at the name. These men, how come I to be entangled with one of them, though really and in partly my better judgment pleads for a single life, yet I cannot help proceeding from one step to another, for when any of my former objections occur, this AC, by one means or another, persuades me to think different. So, I suppose, is the case with other poor women who are cajoled by degrees to lose their liberty, and then they have nothing to do but quietly submit. Let me consider the situation of Mary, many of my married acquaintance. What have they gained by sacrificing themselves to care and confinement, perhaps a son and husband, and to increase their joy several children who have been brought into the world at the expense of their own health, perhaps forever? And then what care, anxiety, what solicitude does their education certainly inflict, and the more proportion, as the parent is careful to discharge her duty, is consistent with the fitness of things that men and women's lots are so unequal. But though I may flatter myself that I may shall be exempt from their cares in matrimony, I cannot be certain. But my reflections come too late. They ought to have arisen before the table linen, etc., etc., brought. There are several key issues at stake for Betty regarding her transition from single adolescent to married woman um, in this passage. And they seem to center around this idea of, what have her married acquaintances, particularly Quaker women, gained by sacrificing themselves to care and confinement without love and respect? What additional benefit might be derived from entering into this new state that she does not already have as a single young woman? Arguably, based on the sardonic downcast tone of this section and many other passages of her diary after this point, very little. So the fate that awaits Betty, the fate that arouses such trepidation and anguish, is what she observes to be the perpetual servitude of a wife and mother, compared to the agency of adolescence. It was anticipated, um, as Vickery writes, that after marriage, men got off their knees following the demands placed on them during courtship, and metaphorically, at least, women got down on theirs. Speaking of her future and other single women like her who await marriage, Father Gill comments that she might find herself permanently tethered to a son and husband, finding amongst her new burdens the unenviable task of appeasing his moods and desires. No doubt Alexander Stone um, cold correspondence did little to ease Father Gill's concerns of this. Elsewhere, Betty notes friends who have become, quote, subjects to the control of a husband, without the time to pursue their usual intellectual pursuits, religious convictions, or to meet with friends as they did in adolescence. Mary Morris Knowles would later go on to describe this um, as, oh, marriage, this thing called marriage, it's a chain and often a rusty one. The difficulty of injuring an insipid husband, though Betty writes, were compounded by the prospect of motherhood. Children, Betty claims, are brought into the world at the expense of their mother's health, perhaps forever. 
In due course, these physical burdens of motherhood would also give way to the spiritual and moral responsibilities of being a good educator and spiritual guide for children. And given the number of children that were often raised at home during the middle classes and the proportion of the work that fell to women, this could be a very arduous task. So such was the mother's lot that she was often attended by apparently by poor health, anxiety and solicitude. Um, this is um, also highlighted the day after um, in the count the data she records making this first solemn step towards matrimony um, when she calls in to see um, a friend. Quote, we found her engaged in making a frock for her bell. How different did the grave mother appear from the sprightly girl she was at school? Two children and a third near coming are solemn circumstances without an amiable tender husband to afford consolation. The consequences of this mother's ordeal, Betty claims, is to make her near unrecognisable from her adolescent form. The difference between the two states is written upon the skin. The health and vigour of the sprightly girl and the exhaustion, ill health and languor of the grave mother. Such was the perceived difference between the lives of female adolescents and adults that many young women write at the prospect of losing friends to marriage and its emotional and physiological demands. Just as a quick aside here, it's telling that a century often fixated with the health of young women, particularly in medical discourse linked to menstruation and moderation. Adolescents in their own writing choose instead to reflect on the differences between sprightly girls and grave mothers. Their diaries and letters are often not afraid to point out the irony of medical concerns about adolescent bodies in view of the mother's greater ordeals. But certainly as well, there is also a spiritual dimension, as well as the physical and psychological dimension to Betty's objections as well. Although it features less prominently in this section, it appears elsewhere in her diary. She writes of being apprehensive that Alexander's moods and her marital duties might affect her spiritual devotions. Betty's adolescent writings are punctuated with periods of intense introspection into the state of her character. She records spending many hours in deep thought, isolated away from others, and, quote, glad of an opportunity of retiring into my own mind and inquiring whether I was prepared for death. This, she fears, will no longer be possible if her future husband is not equally committed to him and his wife, wife's self-transformation. She writes to sparing me, quote, how little our present race of men, uh, young men, mind the solemn duties of religion, with them instead championing the fashions and foibles of the present age. So Betty writes of a friend whose, quote, husband's example perhaps may have seduced her mind away from that sensibility of good my aunt once says she possessed, lamenting how dangerous it is to be tenderly connected with a person that slights the duties of religion. As Phyllis Mack writes in her article on religion, feminism and the problem of agency, Quaker women and others defined agency not as the freedom to do what one wants, but as the freedom to do what is right. And for Betty, marriage appears to threaten such agency, depriving her of the time, physical and uh, physiological health, as well as a spiritual voice compared to that um, of her husband. So on the theme of spiritual companionship, then, it's not just that Betty fears that her husband might slight the duties of religion, but that she might be denied the time and the opportunity of engaging with other friends on matters of faith. Um, now, much of uh, Betty's adolescent diaries uh, in her late adolescence um, concerns her social interactions and debates with friends in the society. Um, I use the term friend here in, in the formal sense of the Quaker term for friend as, as, as a congregational member. So Betty writes of her social interactions as a form of spiritual formation, choosing to associate with those who create this idea of uh, a Quaker perfect society ahead of the end times. In this case, social relations were not a, a distraction from uh, matters of faith, simply a polite diversion, but they had a religious meaning in the society she keeps, evidenced here in how Betty Stewart draws strength and moral lessons from the company of others and then records this in her diary. Consequently, she frets that without the freedom to maintain spiritual friendships she had established in youth, she would become, quote, as a ship without an anchor agitated by every wind that blows and without peace. After such precise instruction in virtues and the benefits of faith by her uncle and aunt, marriage thus appeared as a direct threat to her spiritual journey. She had started in childhood and been guided through childhood and began to take ownership for in adolescence. Consequently, all in all, the charges laid at Alexander's feet were grave. 
If, as Betty feared, he was like these men who cajoled women by degrees to lose their liberty, this match risked her earthly and spiritual happiness, jeopardizing her physical and psychological health and religious fervor. In her account of marriage then, Father Gill appears perhaps reminiscent of the sentiments of Mary Wollstonecraft in the decades to come, and Mary Astell in the late uh, 17th century, who wrote of marriage that woman puts uh, that woman in marriage, woman puts herself entirely into her husband's power. And if the matrimonial yoke be grievous, neither law nor custom affords her that redress which a man obtains. Indeed, she appears at odds with much of contemporary conduct literature from the period that extolled the relative glories and virtues of feminine sensibility and motherhood. Despite contemporary uh, texts praising the virtue um, of motherhood. Um, her writing speaks to the belief of scholars today who claim that new refinement of the 18th century was just old slavery writ large. Like Wollstonecraft, Betty does not object to marriage in principle, rather she objects that too often in practice, Quaker doctrine on the mutual efforts of man and wife were uncut by proud or cold men more attentive to the whims of fashionable society than the advice of poor contemptible women. So evidence of Betty's support for marriage in doctrinal principle was evident um, when her uncle Samuel draws together a, a group of young Quakers, quote, into a dispute upon the prerogative of husbands and wives, where he insisted upon blind obedience of the latter to the former. Betty writes that after the group had strenuously opposed him, the uncle set the matter right, claiming that share should be, quote, no obligation on one side more than the other, but a mutual endeavor to promote the other's happiness. Whilst apparently willing to enter into the condition of dependency in principle with the right man, Betty resists the notion that she might not be able to exercise subjectivity in her subjection. The issue at stake then is whether she has chosen the right partner who will afford her a degree of personal agency. To maintain Betty's ability to engage in the exercise of choice, the satisfaction of individual preferences, and the capacity for rational self-government that her adolescence had up until now afforded her. So as such, the rupture she anticipated between her adolescent self and the adulthood that she expected was coming was one that ultimately could have been avoided in theory if she had identified and formed an attachment with a man willing to afford her these religious and personal freedoms um, in married life. So Betty's entrance into a formally recognised adulthood is thus precipitated by an acknowledgement of a conflict in the world of 18th century Quakerism regarding the legitimacy of female voices and agency. She is forced to realise that despite her theological justifications for greater parity in marriage, it's too often the case in practice that men and women's lots are so unequal. Eyes opened to a, a, what appears to be a narrowing future, she writes that, quote, this shall serve as a future lesson, how I place so unbounded a confidence in a man who does not share her religious outlook and that she should have perhaps listened to my bitter judgment that really and partly ple uh, pleads for a single life. She is thus inherently doubtful that any man other than her uncles uh, and her family might share her worldview and offer this level of mutual respect. Consequently, she begins to question, where did I ever find a man that reached my standard? I have formed a creature in imagination too perfect to be found. So by virtue of the discontinuity between Betty's upbringing and the commonly observed state of marriage, in Betty's writing, adolescence appears as a, great, a time of greater social, religious, intellectual and physical liberties than the adulthood she describes for many women. I just want to take a moment to focus explicitly on the development of Betty's uh, intellectual inner life in adolescence in contrast to this vision of adulthood that she presents. Betty's personal convictions regarding the rights of young women with respect to male acquaintances seem to stem from the vitality of Betty's education. In particular, her family status and her geographic location seem to have helped her cultivate a particularly rich inner life in adolescence. So firstly is Betty's family. It seems that rather than detract from their niece's intellect, during her short stay in London, her uncle Samuel uh, and her uncle John Fothergill actively reminded Betty of the expense spared um, to encourage her education. In her company, Samuel preaches to the group of young Quakers at the Grace Church uh, Street meeting, uh, which is a prick, uh, was pictured a couple um, of slides before, that um, of the sanctity of human intelligence infused with universal 
personal love truth, regardless of the individual's class or gender. So when at home with their nieces, Samuel and his wife Susanna encouraged Betty and her sister Molly to quote, to remember the advantages we enjoyed with respect to example and the pains taken to educate, to train our minds in the paths of religion and virtue, advantages which many were deprived of, and to remember from whom we sprung and whose niece and granddaughters we were in their conversation particularly and in their conduct. Betty writes of how my whole heart was conceived of the importance of these truths. She appears aware of, aware of family expectations of her conduct, but also the benefits um, that um, came with these expectations in terms of the education it afforded her. So as this passage gestures, Betty and uh, Betty's uncle and aunt ensured Betty was uh, provided with the material she needed to cultivate an active, vibrant life of the mind. Betty appears to engage uh, with self-education as well as um, through reading widely and explicitly notes uh, reading Pohl, Addison, Swift, Thompson, Gray and Johnson, whilst reproducing extracts from uh, Edward Young's The Compliant or uh, Night Thoughts on Life, Death and Immortality and Lady Sarah Pennington's An Unfortunate Mother's Advice from her absent, um, to her absent daughters, among others. As of yet, we don't know enough about um, Quaker girls' education in terms of reading habits, and yet the richness of Quaker girls' writing, like those of Betty, would provide a fascinating set of sources for analysis for this idea of um, cultivating an inner life through self-education in adolescence. As well as providing reading materials, though, her uncles also um, set about providing appropriate and stimulating company, developing that, 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 that spiritual companionship that we spoke about before. Um, in this sense, geography also played an important role in shaping Betty's um, overtly positive attitude towards adolescence. Although at first Betty appears actively um, appears to actively disapprove of London, it seems that the access it afforded to prominent members of polite and fashionable society, as well as renowned Quaker friends and meeting, alters her perspective in the long run. Among a host of dinner parties, meetings, visits and day trips, Betty recounts in her diary various trips and meals with the famous physician, Dr John Coakley Letson, who is pictured on the left hand side here, including one to see, quote, the tower where we saw everything but the wild bear, which I had not sufficient resolution to see. Later, she writes having breakfasted with Samuel Galton, who was a, an arms manufacturer and local politician, and Baron Dimmesdale, who famously, um, a few months prior, um, quote, made such a noise in the world from his receiving so many marks of favour and friendship of one of the greatest sovereigns in Europe. Um, she's referring here to uh, Catherine the Great, um, as he was involved in variolating her and her son uh, against smallpox. So these are just a handful of the prominent figures that Betty meets uh, and debates with in her day to day um, experience in London in the residence of her uncle's house. Now Betty owns that she was very much pleased and, and perhaps my ambition was a little flattered to break bread with such company and with being able to converse with, their, uh, with such men on relatively equal terms as part of her intellectual and religious self-development. Enabled access to these important figures within 18th century Quakerism by virtue of her family and her location, Betty becomes a reactive participant in social activities in a broad, networking pe uh, broad network of people that reinforces Betty's intellectual confidence um, and certainty in her selfhood and identity. These interactions allow her to combine polite socialising with spiritual formation, forming a self and collective identity in female adolescence, defined by confident faith and middle class sociability. Perhaps this helps explain and contextualise Betty's reluctance to accept what she perceived to be a husband who appeared to demonstrate a lack of respect for her counsel in her write his writing and offered more, a more restrictive life back in Warrington after maybe the lights or the, the glimmers of London. It threatened to undermine the respect and esteem that she had come to expect in company in recent times and potentially place limits on her ability to engage in self-education. So observing the wife's task of quiet submission then, Betty writes with definite unease. She's aware of a seemingly conflicting instructions from her uncle to body, embody competence, virtue and moral rectitude, as well as sorry, moral rectitude, as well as broader social expectations of her fiance to embody restraint, benevolence and passivity. So this counter image of late adolescence created in Betty's diary, which 
she often characterizes apparently in opposition to wifehood and motherhood, is far more positive than many contemporary accounts of youth in this period afford. I'm not talking about youth here as, as something that's related to childhood. I'm, I'm explicitly related to this post-pubescent period um, of life. So whilst much conduct literature from the period spoke of a smooth transition away from a rocky, unstable female youth towards young women's natural, innate destiny as a wife and mother, Betty writes of the reverse. Adolescence is a period of relative joy, intellectual um, exploration, social freedom and contentment. She recalls having the constant love and support of guardians, the time to undertake individual pursuits, including reading, writing, debate, social diversions and spiritual inquiries. Adolescence, uh, sorry, adulthood is marked by marriage, instead appears tasking, constraining, even frightening to her. So Betty's recorded experience of her liminal state between um, life stages, thus brings to the floor her complex changing status as a, as a young woman within the Quaker community. As a figure who must embody free choice and intellect without directly threatening the established patriarchal order uh, within marriage. After all, for all of her uncle's guidance that in marriage there should be no more obligation on one side than the other, but a mutual endeavour to promote the other's happiness. Betty's social encounters with young men and masculine pride teach her not to flatter myself that she will be exempt from the cares of matrimony. For Betty, her failure to identify a phoenix in a partner, a man who might provide her with the same lifestyle and support as her uncle's, means she perceives her entrance into marriage as an act of self-sacrifice to the demands of others, particularly to men. In many ways, Father Gill wasn't wrong. Over the course of the next 25 years, she gave birth to 14 children, losing a number during infancy and childhood. Her descendants, who donated these volume diaries to the Society of Friends Library, submitted no other work from Betty, and we have no other details of her life past this point other than the birth records and her gravestone, in which she is simply identified as a widow of Liverpool. In summary then, Betty's diaries offer scholars an interesting prism, a new frame of reference in which to consider the experience of gendered maturation and women's changing social status in Quaker communities in England in the 18th century. As Judith Jennings states, more research is needed on the lives of devout females who are not ministers to understand the spectrum of acceptable ways of being a Quaker. As with spiritual journeys of ministers, however, some of the published journals of women uh, friends are heavily redacted, so, not may, so may not present a complete story. Betty's unpublished, unredacted diary offers us the opportunity to explore how young women might interpret and embody Quakerness throughout the female life cycle. Um, and in this case, particularly how they might learn it, what, what ideals they might elevate um, or criticize. So combined with other similar adolescent Quaker diaries and writings then, scholars can begin reconstructing the diverse spectrum of beliefs concerning the rights of Quaker women in the 18th century, as well as adolescent engagement in shaping private, public and social spheres. Far from, far from being passive receptacles of information, social or religious instruction, diaries like Betty's show adolescents were active interpreters in shaping their social, intellectual, romantic and religious worlds, despite constraints. Accounts such as hers allow scholars to examine agency and autonomy in female adolescence in the face of oppressive patriarchal um, hierarchical expectations of female behaviour. They are not simply a mere addition, an added extra to what exists in the scholarship already. Rather, adolescent perspectives make it possible to reconsider, reimagine some of the key movements, hierarchical structures and social changes that define this period of English history. That is, if we consult their writings and give them a platform in scholarship. Women did not often have biographies that saw consistent and sustained intellectual output across the life cycle. So it's important to consider the implications of writing produced at different stages of women's life for intellectual, religious and women's histories, including adolescence. Thank you. <laughs>